morning we are looking at Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, just a few verses at the very end of the chapter, I believe. Verses 41 through 44. That uh, story that has been entitled, The Widow's uh, Might. And I believe uh, coming from the King James uh, language, perhaps the idea of the very small amount the widow gave to the Lord, and yet how she gave more than everybody else gave, and perhaps everyone else combined, because she gave all that she had. There's a lesson on giving here that we need to uh, see, so may the Lord grant us grace this morning to see it. Mark 12, verses 41 through 44. And he sat down opposite the treasury, and began observing how the multitude were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amount to a cent. And calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surplus. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, I do think it's interesting how the Lord providentially arranges uh, the scriptures. I mean, this, this was not planned out in advance that we'd be looking at the health and wealth movement last Lord's Day. I mean, I did that without even looking ahead to what was, what was coming here. But it's interesting that we would have this topic in front of us, especially after critiquing the health and wealth movement last time. Remember, the health and wealth movement teaches that God's will for you is that you be uh, healthy all the time. All you need to do is have enough faith and God will heal you. And that you be wealthy. I mean, that you be rich uh, beyond perhaps your wildest dreams. All you need to do is simply give to the Lord, plant a seed of faith, and give it to a God-ordained ministry that teaches and believes this, and God will bless you. Well, we did note uh, when we looked at that that God's will in many cases is that you not be made well, at least not right away, because the Lord brings things into your life to teach you, uh, if nothing else, your reliance upon Him. Paul said he was content with his weakness because in his weakness he had God's strength. And he would rather than be weak in himself so that God's strength may be in him than be strong in himself and not have the Lord's strength. Paul himself was afflicted and God did not heal him. It's not always God's will that we be made well. And we also saw that in most cases it is not God's will that you be rich because riches will destroy you. As a matter of fact, there are many, many warnings in Scripture about desiring to be rich because, as you know, riches can undo a person. When you get rich, as the psalmist reminded, I think it was Agur, that you forget the Lord because all your, your needs are met even beyond that. You don't see uh, any danger ahead. You don't see any reason to depend on the Lord, and so you forget him. So Agur, when he prays, he says, Lord, don't give me poverty so that I'll be tempted to steal, but don't make me rich on the other hand so that I'll forget you, but give to me what I need. Give to me what is my daily bread. Give to me what will help me to serve you better. That's what we ought to be seeking after. So God may give riches sometimes to those to whom he also gives the grace to be able to manage those riches without being destroyed by them but most often doesn't give them to his people. Rather, he gives them to unbelievers and knowing what it's going to do to them. Uh, again, this is all in God's hands, and he is very just when he does these things. But what I want us to see this morning, on the other hand, is that we, just because God is not going to make us rich does not mean that God is not going to provide for us or give to us what we need or give to us even beyond what we need because he has actually promised to do abundantly beyond all we ask or think if we are faithful in our stewardship to him. Now, the Puritans, interestingly enough, who were as far away from the health and wealth movement as you can possibly imagine, 
firmly believed that giving was the key to increasing your riches, actually becoming, as it were, wealthy, but not always wealthy in the sense that the health and wealth people mean. Certainly that God would provide our needs and would provide them abundantly in this life, but also that he would provide abundantly for us in the life to come, that we would be rich in heaven. If we are faithful to worship the Lord with the first of our increase, uh, by the giving of our tithes and our offerings, God says that he will be faithful to bless all that you have and that he will increase it for your good and for your family and that you'll be storing up treasures in heaven where the Bible says no one can take it from you. Now, there's none of those house robberies in heaven because a thief cannot break in and steal, nor will those things ever be corrupted. Now this morning, we want to look at giving and how it is commended by the Lord in the example of this widow. Now last week, we saw the Lord in the temple giving a warning against the, the pride and the hypocrisy of the scribes, against the, the pride that they had in seeking to draw attention to themselves when we should be and they should have been seeking to draw attention to the Lord. God has not put us into this world to be famous, but he has put us into the world to make him famous. We should be letting our light shine in such a way that it draws attention to God and not to us. And then the warning against hypocrisy, that these scribes are parading around as such righteous and holy men, but they were living such ungodly lives while they were making long prayers, as it were, making pretense to godliness at the same time they were taking advantage of widows and even selling their prayers. The Lord reminded us that we need to purify our hearts of all these things through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ by trusting him and then letting his spirit work a, a holiness or a purity from the inside to the outside, a true Godliness, not just a veneer of godliness that the scribes had because that veneer would not help them on the day of judgment when the Lord would peel it back and expose them for what they really were, which was a bunch of hypocrites. The Lord would have true godliness within us because that's the only thing that's going to help us on the day of judgment. The evidence of a godly life, remember on the day of judgment, it's our lives that are going to be put on, on trial not just our profession, not just what we said, but what we actually did. The Bible says that if our lives are the pattern of a practice of righteousness, then that will show that we really do love the Lord. But if our lives, on the other hand, are a practice of ungodliness, it will show that we really do not know the Lord. The evidence of a godly life is what argues a changed heart. And that's what you need if you were to stand before the Lord on that day. Well, that's what we saw again last week. But now we see the Lord as he has completed his teaching in the temple on that particular occasion, decide to go to a place where he can watch the people making their contributions to the worship of God's house in order to teach his disciples and us a lesson on giving. This morning, I would like for us to look at four things. First of all, that giving is a part of the worship that God requires of us, a part of our stewardship. Secondly, that if we don't have a lot to give, we shouldn't be concerned because the Lord does not, uh, as it were, evaluate our giving based upon the, the amount that we give, but it's based upon the sacrifice that we make. Thirdly, that when you give, you have to give with the right motives if you were to expect God to fulfill, as it were, his blessings to you. And then fourthly, you need to know that when you do give to the Lord in this way, that he will bless you beyond what it is you have given to him. Now, that's the part we need to be careful about because we don't want to fall into the health and wealth movement. We did see that these promises are true, but they're not saying what these folks are saying they're saying. It's saying something a bit different that we need to understand. God promises that he will bless us. He will meet needs. We will be storing up treasures in heaven. 
but he doesn't want us to seek to become rich in this way for that in and of itself. That is not the goal. Well, first of all, let's consider that giving is a part of the worship that God desires of us. Now, as I've said, Jesus, having finished his teaching, sits down across from the treasury and was watching the people make their donations, as it were. Uh, remember that this last week of Jesus' life is a time when there's a lot of Jews in Jerusalem. And the reason is because of the Feast of Passover. That would draw all the male Jews from every part of the Roman uh, Empire to Jerusalem. It was one of those feasts that they were required to appear before the Lord. Now, because of that, they had brought their contributions, which would be hard to make if you're on the other end of the Roman Empire. But they were bringing them to the Lord at the feast and bringing them to the temple that they might put those contributions in there. Now, why were they doing that? because that's what the Lord commanded as a part of their worship. Apparently, there were 13 chests that were in what's called the court of the women with trumpet-shaped openings, as it were, or mouths to receive these various offerings. Nine of the chests were to receive offerings that were due by command that the Lord had commanded, and four were for free will offerings but all of them were for the maintenance of the temple worship. In other words, giving was a part of what the Lord required in order to support the worship of God's people that was going on at the temple. It was something required of all of his people. We're going to look at that in just a moment a little bit more. Now, we realize today that there is no temple that we can go to, and there aren't 13 chests with trumpet-shaped openings in which to put in our, our offerings, and yet... The need to support the worship of the Lord still remains in place today. Now, in the Old Covenant, the Lord required a tithe or a tenth to be given to support it, and that was something that was true even before the institution of the Old Covenant system or the ceremonial system or the temple system. Abraham, after he returned from the slaughter of the kings in order to rescue his nephew Lot, as he was returning, met or was met by Melchizedek, priest of the Lord, king of Salem. And Abraham gave to Melchizedek a tenth of all the spoils or all the increase that Abraham had received. Uh, several years later, when Jacob sets out to Paddan Aram, and he, he prays to the Lord, he says, Lord, if you're willing to bless my journey and prosper me, whatever you give to me, I will give you a tenth. And so... The Lord did bless him, and Jacob, we'll have to assume, was faithful in his giving. Now, when the law was finally instituted, God gave a specific command that a tenth of all that he had blessed his people with would be given to support the work of the temple. By the way, we're looking at, at just the support of the temple because that's what the woman was doing in this case. Uh, we should see giving is more broadly than, than just giving to support the work of the ministry. It's something that the Lord would have us to be doing in all different areas, as I've already mentioned. But as I mentioned, God gave a commandment to his people to give a tenth of their increase and to give it to support those who were laboring in the temple. Actually, the tenth would be given to the Levites, and then the Levites would give a tenth to the priests to support them. We read about that in Leviticus 27, Numbers 18, well, and Numbers 18. The Lord says through Moses, all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. Then in Numbers 18, verse 21, to the sons of Levi, behold, I have given all the tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for the service which they perform, the service of the tent of meeting. And then, as I mentioned, the Levites would tithe of what they received of, of the tithe of the nation of Israel, and they would give it to the sons of Aaron, again in verses 26 and 28. Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites and say to them, when you take from the sons of Israel the tithe which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then you shall present an offering from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. So you shall also present an offering to the Lord from your tithes, which you receive from the sons of Israel, and from it you shall give the Lord's offering to Aaron. 
the priest. So basically, the point was that all who served in the temple or the tabernacle were cared for by the tithe that God's people gave according to his command. Now, one thing I do want to make uh, clear here that was true then and is true here as well. These people never gave, the people of Israel never gave to the Levites. And the Levites really never gave to the priests, even though we've just read about that. The people gave to the Lord. And the Levites gave to the Lord. And the Lord gave what they gave to him to those whom he wills. Sometimes I think when, when we are, are giving, we think about you know, we're giving to this person or we're giving to that church or something like that. We must never look at it that way. We're giving to the Lord. And that's important to see because the Lord is the one who's going to repay you. It's not the person you're, you know, that you think you're giving to that's going to pay you back, but the Lord is going to do that. So when you give, you need to realize that you're giving to the Lord and not to man. Now, in the New Covenant, the requirement to support the worship of the Lord still certainly applies because there are those who devote themselves to full-time ministry. One thing about the Levites was that God never gave them a land inheritance. He, he really didn't give them property. He didn't give them the time to go out and farm and take care of themselves. They devoted themselves full-time to taking care of the ceremonial system and doing all the work within the tabernacle first and then in the temple, which means that they were doing a work that didn't really make any kind of an increase or any kind of you know, something that they could use to support themselves, which is why they needed to be supported by the tithe. And so when the Lord gave all the people of the, of the land, all of Israel, their lands, he told them that they needed to give this tithe. And they also gave a certain portion of, uh, of land to areas where the Levites lived so that they would be able to do certain things with that as well. But the fact is, because they devoted themselves to the Lord's work, God gave them what the people gave to him, to them, to support them. Now, the same thing, as I've said, is true in New Testament worship as well, because there are those who are devoted to full-time ministry. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 and 14, do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple and those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar? So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. Now where is that living supposed to come from except from the tithes, which the Lord has required of his people, and the offerings? Jesus said to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin, which are the spices, as it were, of their gardens, and have neglected the weightier provisions of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. But these are the things you should have done without neglecting the others. Now, Jesus is telling them, you're, you're doing these things. You're being very precise in your tithing. You'll even take the spices that your gardens produce, and you'll make sure you set apart a tenth of even of the spices and give that to the Lord, but you've overlooked the major things, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. He says you should have done those things without neglecting the others. So he wasn't reproving them for their tithing. He was reproving them for missing out on things that were even more important than their tithing. By the way, we would have to assume that Jesus required this of his disciples as well, unless, of course, they'd be considered, I mean, the ones that were actually with him would be considered those who would be supported by giving rather than giving themselves. But even they had to give. They had to give a tenth, even as the Levites who received a tithe, paid a tithe, and so forth. This was the pattern that God had given before the law was given. This was the, the requirement that he made in the law. And since the need still exists to support the Lord's work, I do believe that this requirement would still be in force upon us. Some believe that because God has been so much more generous with us in the new covenant that our obligation becomes even greater. 
Now, one thing we need to realize is that God doesn't have to repeat everything in the New Testament to show that something continues, the obligation to give. I mean, we've already seen a commandment that indicates that God would have us to continue to give. But whether it still be a tenth, if this is the pattern God shows and we see nothing that really actually indicates that, that he's changed that, then we should assume that that's what the Lord has taught us, which is why many churches believe that we tithe or give a tenth of our increase to the Lord, and then beyond that, we give offerings. So here's the principle. Here's the requirement. This is what is a part of our stewardship to the Lord. Now, we'll have to admit that this can be a hard thing to, to hear or to listen or to receive. Because in a large measure, our happiness and our security, our preservation, virtually everything we depend on seems to come from the amount of money that we have. It's connected. It's one of the reasons why, again, Agur prayed the prayer that he did. Don't give me too much so that I'll forget you. Don't give me too little so that I'll be tempted to steal. There's a lot that is connected to our income or our money. So it's a difficult thing for us to hear messages like this. But one thing we want to look at in just a few moments is that God has made a promise. If we are faithful in this area, that he will bless us in such a way that this concern should not be a concern for us at all. Rather, we should be concerned that we're not doing what the Lord has called us to do because then we can expect not to have our needs met. So let's, let's press on. Second point I wanted to make is this, and this is based upon the widow herself. Don't be concerned whether or not the Lord has given you very much to give because the Lord doesn't look at the amount. He looks at the sacrifice. Now, as Jesus was watching those making their contributions, he saw many of the rich making large contributions to the treasury. Perhaps in Sunday school classes years ago, you saw those pictures. I, I remember, still have in my mind, a picture of a, several men coming with big bags of big coins and they're dumping it into these trumpet-shaped openings and all this money is ringing in the chest. Well, that was going on. There were a lot of rich people who were coming and they were giving a lot of money. But then Jesus saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins, which together amounted to a cent. Then he called his disciples to himself and he said, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. By which Jesus meant either that she put in more than any one single person, you know, she put in the most, or that she put in more than all of them put together. Now, we might ask the question, how can that be since all she put in was a penny? And really, a penny in those days, as I understand it, was, was worth one 128th of a denarius, which you know a denarius is a day's wage. So you have a day's wage for a day's work. She put in what was one 128th of a day's wage. Well, Jesus said the reason why she put in more was because they gave out of their surplus they had far more than they needed. And once they gave, they had plenty left over. But she gave out of her poverty. He says, all that she owned, all that she had to live on. Now, the Lord doesn't measure what you give merely by the amount that you give, by, but rather by what you have. If you have a lot, you might give a lot, but in the Lord's eyes, it may not be that much because it's not that much of a sacrifice. But if you only have a little, and you give just a little, if what you give is a great sacrifice on your part, the Lord will count it as much more than what the other person gives. In other words, our Lord is telling us, you don't have to have a lot to give a lot to him. And that becomes very important as we look at the very last point. But let's move on to, one, to the third point, OK? You don't, well, the Lord would have us to give. You don't have to give a lot uh, in order, well, actually, you don't have to have a lot to give a lot. You can give a little, but if it's a lot of what you have, then the Lord counts it as much. Thirdly, we do need to make sure, as we saw last Lord's Day evening, 
that in our giving, that we give for the right motives. Because if we give for the wrong motives, we should not expect to receive anything. You need to be careful that what you do, you do for the Lord. Now, the health and wealth movement would say, <clears throat> give because God wants to give to you. Give and God will give back to you. Press down, shaken together, running over, and, and all that. Now, the Lord tells us, don't give to receive. Don't give to be made rich, but rather give because you love the Lord. Give because you want to honor him. Give because you want to be faithful to him. Give because of who he is. Give because of what he's given to you. Give with a desire to glorify him and advance his cause. Because this is what is pleasing to the Lord. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking again about something we saw not too long ago. And that is the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ, because he is fully man as well as fully God, can either be happier or sadder depending upon what his people do. We can actually increase Jesus' pleasure in heaven by doing what is pleasing to him. We can also, of course, grieve him if, if what we do is, is wrong in, in any area. Obedience pleases him and disobedience grieves him. You can do that because, again, Jesus is a man as well as God. As God, of course, he's perfectly happy and can't be made any happier. But as a man, he can be. And so here, we need to give in order to please the heart of the Savior, in order to bless him. I mean, Jesus has given us a great deal, hasn't he? Uh, he's the one who made the heavens and the earth. He's the one who made you. He's the one who came into this world as one of his creatures who lived for you, who died for you, who was raised again to life for you, who has provided for you every single day of his life. He is given to you. When you give, you need to give to him. You need to give to honor him. And that is the only reason why you give. Now here is the final point. That if you are faithful to give what it is that God has given to you and you do it with the right motives, if you do it for his pleasure, it will be his pleasure to bless you in return. Now this widow gave all that she had even the money that she had for food on that particular day, we're really not told why she did this. I mean, we're not really given a view into her heart. Why did she do what she did? But it really wouldn't be a stretch of the imagination to assume that because of her willingness to give all that she had and the fact that Jesus draws the attention of his disciples to this, that she did it because she really loved the Lord. That she was giving with a view to honoring the Lord seeking to fulfill his commandment, even though she had very little to give, but also, I think, with a view to a specific promise that God gives in Scripture, that if we are faithful to give to him, and if we are faithful to seek to honor him and to pleasure him in this way, he, it will be faithful to bless us in ways that we can hardly imagine. Paul writes this in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 through 9. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed, as it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now this widow, again, had very little, something that might have provided for her needs for the day, perhaps enough money to get a little bit of food to sustain her on that day, but instead of using it for that purpose, she gave it to the Lord. And because it was all she had to give, the Lord counted it as much. You might say that she sowed bountifully, and so she would reap bountifully. Well, how is it that she sowed bountifully? She only gave a penny. It was because it was all she had. It was a sacrifice on her part. 
So she sowed bountifully, she would reap bountifully, the Lord would take care of her needs. Now again, let's not make the mistake of the health and wealth movement by saying this because the majority of the blessings that God is promising us for our giving are not going to be necessarily material and it's not going to be to fill our coffers that we might be rich so that we can buy those things we always wanted, you know, the, the pink Cadillac or whatever I suppose today would be more like the, the red Ferrari, you know, or the mansion or all those different types of things, you know, that we might desire of this world, but rather that we might have abundance not only to take care of our needs, but to do good to others, to continue to be abundant in our giving. But let's not forget, too, that the majority of the reason why the Lord, well, of the blessings that God gives back to us have to do with treasures in heaven. Again, the health and wealth movement would, would limit this virtually to physical blessings. But there are blessings beyond that. There are spiritual blessings in life. There are physical blessings, which we're going to get back to in a moment. But we're storing up treasures in heaven. Let's not forget what we saw at the very beginning. Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I hope you were watching the uh, quotes on the screen at the beginning because there was a, a wonderful quote there by, I believe he was a bishop in the English church. I know that uh, Whitfield highly valued what are called Hall's uh, contemplations. Well, Bishop Hall, Joseph Hall writes this, Christianity teaches me, this is on your bulletin by the way, Christianity teaches me that what I charitably give alive, I carry with me dead. And experience teaches me that what I leave behind, I lose. I will carry that treasure with me by giving it, which the worldling loses by keeping it. So while his corpse shall carry nothing but a winding cloth to his grave, I shall be richer under the earth than I was above it. You know, what he says here is absolutely true. But again, because our health, or not our health, but our, our happiness, <laughs> And our, our preservation seems so wound up in our, in our wealth that we have a hard time letting go of it. Our Lord is actually telling us that by letting go of it, we'll prosper even more. We will certainly prosper in heaven more. We will be richer. I mean, isn't it true that it's only what we give away that we're going to be able to take with us? And yet, we're so reluctant to give it away because either we maybe are not confident that that's where we're going or we're not confident that that place even exists, or we're not confident that, um, you know, that, well, again, that um, God's going to reward me for what I do. But the fact is, God doesn't lie, and this is true. And the more we give, the more we will receive. But getting back to the other point, we can't exclude the fact that the blessing that God promises, the blessings perhaps in their, you know, in their whole package actually do break through into this world. I think the widow was looking to the Lord to take care of her, not sometime in the future or in heaven. He wasn't going to just let her starve so she could go to heaven to enjoy those treasures, but she was looking to him to provide for that day. Do you think the Lord provided for her that day? I think he did. This bountiful reaping that Paul is talking about here is fulfilled partly on earth. The Lord says he will take care of you if you are faithful in your stewardship to him. As a matter of fact, as we read through Matthew chapter 6, as we get toward the end, he says, don't be concerned about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. God knows that you need all these things. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God will give you these things. Now, he will take care of you if you are faithful. By the way, what does this say to us if we happen to be struggling financially. Now, one thing we need to realize is sometimes God will bring us into that situation because, again, life is going to be, as we're going to see this evening, 
uh, a series of trials that we're going to have to go through to test our faith. He wants to teach us certain things. And I'm not saying there's always a cause and effect relationship between these two. If you're struggling financially, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you're not giving as you should be giving. But sometimes it does mean that. Sometimes it means God's testing us. Sometimes it means it's because we're not being faithful in our stewardship. And perhaps the reason why we're struggling financially is because we haven't yet learned the secret of giving in order to receive the Lord's provision. Now again, this isn't a recipe for becoming filthy rich so that you forget the Lord and, and perish. But what Jesus says is true. In Luke 6:38, perhaps the most quoted verse in all the health and wealth churches, one that I used to hear virtually every Lord's Day when I was in one. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. I believe the Lord is telling us here that he wants us to give, and to the degree that we give, or by the standard by which we measure out to others in their need, the Lord is going to measure back to us. I remember hearing a story about a man who had a business. And apparently, it wasn't extremely lucrative, but uh, it had the potential for growth. And he decided that he was going to live on X amount of money. And he said, Lord, whatever you give me above what, what I need to live on here, and it was pretty meager, I will give to you. And after he made that promise to the Lord and began giving whatever came in above that, the Lord prospered his business until he was giving away lots and lots of money, but he was living on very little money. I mean, the fact is, God is faithful to give and to meet our needs. And sometimes we're not receiving what we need because we're not giving. There's a great example, too, in this, in this uh, movie that was made by Christian Films for Families. And I'm not sure if the story was true or not, but it certainly had a great moral to it. I, I think there may have been some truth to the historicity of it, and that is Charles Dickens. When he was struggling with the fact that he might be poor, he came from a poor background, he was struggling because he couldn't come up with the, the inspiration he needed for a new book. He was concerned that he and his family were going to be out on the street. And he's so worried about it, he can't give. He sees people in need, and he keeps holding back. Well, then he, he goes, his, uh, somehow he, his life goes through this series of events that teaches him that he needs to give. And he starts giving. He starts giving to people in need. And as he does, suddenly he gets this idea for this great new book that is based on his life. And it's called A Christmas Carol. It becomes his bestseller of all time and so forth, and he promises to take very little from that and to give to charity all the proceeds from that particular book. But again, the whole point of the story was if you're so focused on your needs and whether you're going to have what you need so that you can't give in all those areas that the Lord calls us to give, then you're going to find yourself continuing to need, and you're not going to find that provision of the Lord. Again, remember what we saw in Proverbs 11, 24 through 25, there is one who scatters and yet increases all the more. And there is one who withholds what is justly due. And yet it results only in want. The generous man will be prosperous. And he who waters will himself be watered. That is a principle shot through scripture, which is absolutely true. And something that I believe if we learn by God's grace to put into practice, that we will not only be a blessing to many people, but we will also find that we ourselves are going to be blessed. So may the Lord give us the grace to learn from the example of this widow who took the burden of her care out of her own hands, away from the money she had, and by giving the money to the Lord, placed her care in the Lord's hands. We do know that salvation comes purely by grace. We're going to see more about that next Lord's Day morning. By trusting in the Lord alone for our salvation. But we do need to realize in coming to the Lord, God would have us to trust him for other things. Sanctification is something that we work together with the Lord on. It's a working together. And so trust the Lord, trust his word, believe him. Be faithful with the stewardship that he's entrusted to you. Look to his promises, knowing that God is going to provide everything that you need. 
and even more so that you can abound in the continuing work of giving. Well, may the Lord grant each of us the grace to hear this message. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of silent prayer and ask the Lord to apply it to us.